time to look at the rest of the NFL, Logan. Let's just let's just get right to it. Let's get let's give the people what they want. Um, we'll talk about some drafts that we liked uh, and why in, in a few minutes. But uh, I find what the Atlanta Falcons did at the eighth pick indefensible is the word that I will use. That I don't like saying that there are losers on draft day because ultimately it's too hard to project. Like I don't think when Adam Peters in San Francisco took George Kittle and Kyle Juszczyk and all those dudes that they were like, oh, the Niners won the draft. With hindsight, the Niners very clearly did very well that day. Um, so I think it's very hard to to go now because we're all basing it off our own evaluations and we're, we don't know that we're right. But that's why you can look at process. And to me, that's why I find what the Atlanta Falcons did so inexplicable because they spent all that money on Kirk Cousins not a month and a half ago, and then they use a top 10 pick on Michael Penix. And some of this has to do with the player um, for reasons that have nothing to do with the eval, uh, which I can explain. But it's really just to me the process of, uh, like, are you willing to really go for it in the way you need to to win a, win a Super Bowl, which I would think is the goal. And I just think they undercut themselves here. Um, and it's a situation where if you plan for, if, if you have plan B sometimes, it's because you're not actually that confident in plan A. And um, I don't like why then why did you embark on plan A? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I agree. I mean, I, I understand people's frustration. I understand the financial implications, but I just from a from a process standpoint, I find it very intriguing. And what I mean by that is like, you know, what is the most valuable resource in football right now? It's quarterback. Right. And like if you have a quarterback and we also talk about landing spot and developmental process for the quarterback. And when you look at like recent history, the most successful quarterbacks are guys that sit for a little bit, like just in recent history, right? Or they've had like a strong developmental plan. So if your evaluation as the Atlanta Falcons indicate that this guy is your best player, or best quarterback, or maybe he's the number one quarterback on your board. I know there were some teams that had him very, very high because when you look at his physical traits, Michael Penix, like his ability to throw the football is special, right? He can throw yeah. it at a very high level. And so – I've always thought like Philadelphia does a really good job of this and uh, their GM's name escapes me at the moment. Uh, Howie Roseman. How's Howie Roseman does. He, he's, he's been cited as saying that I want to collect quarterbacks and I want to develop quarterbacks because they give me value in terms of the rest of the NFL. Like the Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts thing is a perfect example of that. So to me, I, I know this is probably frustrating for fans of the Atlanta Falcons. And, but I think when you look at the process, like if Kirk starts for two years, you can cut him in that third year or you can trade him with a dead cap hit of what do we say, Craig, $25 million? $25 million, yeah. And you have your starting quarterback for the future. I also would point out that I think in that division, you're going to win the division. You're going to make the playoffs. And then if you get hot, if Kirk gets, if Kirk gets hot at the right time, you make a push for the playoffs. And I don't think it's a terrible decision with the roster as it is, is this now. And so, like, I know people say, oh, you should have taken – Dallas Turner, you should have taken Quinion Mitchell or whoever the player is. But I think it's important for fans to understand from a defensive perspective, like the, the prospects in this class were not like that highly rated, in my opinion. They, like, I don't know if I would have taken any one of them at eight personally, right? Yeah. So to me, taking a quarterback there, it's, I know indefensible is the term you, you used, but I think like if you're, if you're accumulating the most valuable resource in the NFL, that you can either trade or move on from later and you have a succession plan to Kirk while he's here. You can learn from Kirk. You can learn the system. I don't hate that, especially for a new coaching staff that like, again, wants to kind of have their mark on the organization. I don't, and I, again, like this may be clear. I don't disagree with you that it's a very odd decision, but when I sit back and look at it and kind of remove the emotion from it, I'm kind of like, I don't know if I hate it. I, you know, like I under, I, I don't know if I hate it because like I want good quarterbacks. I want to make sure I have a quarterback on my team at all times. So I'm going to quote, uh, well, there's a couple of different angles here, but I'm going to start with a quote from Tom Moore. You remember Tom Moore? No. So Tom Moore was the lead like offensive coach during Peyton Manning's career uh, with the right. Colts. Um, and I think at time, times he was an OC, at times he was like a special assistant, whatever. Like he was Peyton Manning's guy. Yeah. And he was once asked why they don't give Jim Sorgi backup uh the backup to Peyton Manning reps and he goes if Jim has to play we're and we don't practice yeah and I think that is quarterback in the NFL like who was Peyton Manning's backup when they won the Super Bowl like you don't remember who was Tom Brady's backup in the Super Bowl there were a bunch of different guys like if you want to win at the highest level you need to support QB1 I just think quarterback is different only one plays ideally 
Yes, uh, it's nice to have a quality backup because you might need a, a guy to win you a game or two throughout a year uh, to help your playoff seating. But like, if you don't have QB1 at the end of the day and he's not supported well, like you're not winning. And so it really comes down to me, the question, Logan, is this. What are the Atlanta Falcons trying to do? Because if they're trying to just improve their team over the next couple of years and have a bridge to some winning window that opens in you know, three years with Michael Penix and Kirk Cousins is the bridge to that window to help them develop good habits. They made a really expensive decision to do that. Um, but I guess that would be the only defense. But to me, it's like the, the whole value in a quarterback, like you need to pick one of two paths. If you're going to be on a rookie quarterback timeline, you need to spend all your other money getting a bunch of players to support that quarterback. If you are going to go on a veteran quarterback timeline, you need things like top 10 picks to get the elite talent to surround that quarterback if you want to win a Super Bowl. And to me, like splitting that baby, the whole point of, of that story in the Bible, if you will, if we're going to go biblical studies here, is you don't split the baby because you waste the resources there. And it's one thing to do it even with the pick in the 20s like Green Bay did. Uh or if you are Kansas City and Alex Smith is in the last year, entering the last year of his deal, and you can trade him at next to no cap he had two, he after had the two season. Years left. He had two one years left. left on his, but no, because he because Mahomes sat for a year and then they traded him the next year. So he had right, two, years, uh, two left years left when when they drafted him. But yeah. the they the, they didn't just sign him, you know, a month and a half ago. No, no. Right, and so I, I think that that is the difference is like Atlanta has been spending these high draft picks on position talent so that they position themselves where a guy like Kirk Cousins, an upper echelon quarterback in the league, if not an elite one goes like, I want to go there and try to win. And now you draft his backup and then you get into who Penix is himself, which is as one scout told the athletic uh, in a piece they put this morning, like he's the one, the, the one quarterback who definitely doesn't need to sit. He's 20, almost 24 years old. And, you know, when, by the time he plays, he's going to be 27 and you've wasted two years of his rookie deal. Like it's just, it's bad asset management. And in a sport with a salary cap, asset management is the name of the game. And I just think they've, they've cut off their nose to spite their face here. And while they have a succession plan, they've also undercut their path to success. See, I don't, again, I don't know if I agree with that. Like if you're, if you're picking at a, if you're picking at eight, I guess they could have drafted Roma Dunze if they wanted to, I guess they could have drafted Rome. I mean, maybe they could have traded back. And I, I also understand that, right? Like there's not an obvious guy to take at eight, but drafting, like that's the one position you just, it doesn't help your team ideally over the next two years. Cause he doesn't do anything but sit. It doesn't, but I do. Th I, again, I go back to Green Bay and how they've handled the quarterback position, like since I've been like following the NFL, and it's been unconventional. But they've spent first round talents on guys that have sat for multiple years. But we know picks and, in the twenties aren't the same as picks in the top ten. But that's I, I think where that's they got. something. I think that's something that maybe, I, I, maybe that's why this conversation is so difficult. But like they don't get the pick again until what was it forty? Like that's when they're picking again. I don't even know sure. what the next pick was. So that that first round pick to me is technically it's your first player you want to take right so like everyone says oh it's a top 10 pick it's a top 10 pick if i can't trade out i got to take the player i want right i got i have to take the player i want and i think that's the thing i would push back there on is like we get so cut up and i think it's the the national media talking about it and we're part of that so i'm not like besmirching anybody here but like top 10 pick is really the same as a top 20 pick because that's when you get to pick and if i can't trade out of that spot it doesn't matter so if that's the best player on my board like I think uh, what Tennessee did uh, had something like that in the in the draft I think where they drafted Tavondre Sweat at, at with their second round pick which I think was like forty three or something like that and everyone's like that's a terrible overreach but they don't get to pick again until the fourth round so if you think this guy who you have a really high grade on and Michael Penix I'm talking about Atlanta now is not going to be there when you're picking again and he's the best player on your board take him like that's my thought there right that's my right. thought and again and like that's why. Yeah. That, I say, again, that's why I don't really have a problem with the pick. It's the it's the combination of the two, right? Like I have no problem if they want to pick Penix. Is that an overdraft based off what I think Penix is max, you know, best value is? Sure. But if you want to take your guy and you're high on him, I get it. He's got a ton of talent, but you signed Cousins a month and a half ago. Why did you do that? And and this is, I think, why we talk about the research and being a reporter, if you will, is so important if you're an NFL GM. They're like, well, people are like, oh, well, they, how could they have not or known that Penix was going to be available at eight? You can't bank on that. Yeah, you could. No one was taking Michael Penix before right. you at eight. And so don't sign Kirk. Like, again, you can pit, you can sign Kirk. 
You can pick Penix. Doing both is guaranteeing that you're not going to hit your potential ceiling. Yeah, but I think like again, I just think you've accumulated ass, and I and I think we like it, again if you if you take Roma Dunze, maybe right. So you have Roma Dunze, uh, you know Kyle Pitts, and you have like one of the most potent offenses ever, and like Kirk is looking like an awesome player for the next whatever. But <clears throat> if if you said we had to go defense there, like I I have no problem with them saying we our evaluation on these defensive prospects is not that high. And we prefer to take Mark. I have no problem with that because like when you watch Dallas Turner, like I like him a lot as a prospect, but he's very unrefined and it is a little bit of a projection to get him there, to get him there as a pass rusher. Maybe you don't like Latu's medicals, right? Maybe Jared Verse is too stiff. Quinion Mitchell level of competition, right? Like there, that's why we saw a run of what was it like? How many 12, 13 offensive players go in the first round consecutively? Like, so to me, it's, I know people want to make this a binary thing. The pick is fine. I think the the contract is a little bit confounding, but also like didn't had they just extended Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay when they drafted Jordan Love? Like I'm trying to remember. I don't want to. Rodgers, like- Rodgers, had like and Favre both had threatened retirement multiple mm-hmm. times. So right. like even, like Rodgers had I think and, threatened and- retirement. Then they signed him to an extension, so he got more money. And it's like we don't know what this dude's going to do in a year. He goes into dark caves, and we don't know what's going to happen when he comes out. And I also will say this, like, as much as I love Kirk, he's coming off of an Achilles tear at 35 years old. 100%. So, like, I th- I do think there needs to be some something there in terms of that type of thought process. You know but what I mean? My, like, my question would be then, why did you pay him all that money? Because right? I do like, think, I think if you look at Kirk last year, he was a top 10 player. And so I think he got the value that he deserved, like, based on his play. Now, I think you could argue that, like, if you have a concern about the health, then don't pay him that money. And I'm with that 100%. Right. But I, I don't... I don't hate this as much as everybody purports to hate it. I understand there's like I pr- looking back on it. If I'm the GM and Kirk's my guy, I probably draft Roma Dunes and say we have two young studs on the outside with one of the best young tight ends in the NFL with one of the best backs, and we just let it ride because I had a really high grade on Roma Dunze, right? But if you don't feel that way, if you want to make sure that this runway is here for you long term and you think this guy is that talented, like let's say he's the number one player on their board, hypothetically. I have no idea what their board looks like. It sounded like, like he was. How do you bypass him there? You know what I'm saying? And then then that get that gets into it. That's that becomes an evaluation question. Why are you so different than everybody else in the NFL? But if that's how it goes, if they if he's if he's above Caleb Williams for you and he is there at nine, like Trust. It's the same thing with uh, Johnny Newton. If he's the best player on your board and you're picking a 36, take the best player on your board. And but by, but by that's the thing is like to me, this is why quarterback board has to be different than every other position. Because Johnny Newton, even if John Allen balls out the next three years, and Johnny play. Newton is a backup. He's going to play in an ideal world for the Atlanta Falcons. Kirk Cousins is awesome. Not just this year and next year, but yeah. if he's awesome the next two years, are you kicking him out for the $25 million dead cap hit on year three? No, like you're going to let him continue to play. And if we're talking three years of the number eight pick in the 2024 draft, not seeing the field, especially when that player is 24 years old by the time the season starts. Yikes, man. Like that is such a waste of a, such a valuable asset. And I, I know I get your point in terms of like that asset is only as valuable as what's on the board. Right. Right. But this is why I think a lot of GMs, a lot of teams separate quarterback board from the other, the rest of their board. You just have to say like, we don't need that guy. Quarterback is different. We want to win with cousins. That's why we signed him. That's why we paid him all that money. How do we accomplish that? Like, what are we trying to build here? And I also think like when you talk about that asset management point, you know, they can, they can draft a quarterback next year uh, after, uh, you know, whatever with Kirk and that pushes the quarterback contract timeline back a year, or even if they did it with JJ, right. You know, and I'm not saying this because I like JJ over Penix, but JJ is the same exact mold or a very similar mold as Kirk. Right. And he's 21 years old. Like that is a very different project and prospect than 24 year old Michael Penix, who is nothing like Kirk as a player very different off, not very different, but like you're going to change the offense for those two guys. And again, 24 years old injury concerns, the whole deal. Like it just, there's too many factors to me where I'm just like this, this is bad process. This is bad asset management. This is bad cap management. It's bad stuff beyond the the simplicity of where a player is on the board. No, I'm with you. I, I just, I, I mean, I, I just go back to man, quarterbacks are valuable. And I want quarterbacks. I want good quarterbacks. And if I think there's a chance this guy can play, 
Like, if, if and again, I don't agree with the evaluation, right? I, I, I'm not. I'm a little bit off in terms of what Atlanta saw and what I see when I watch film. But if you're looking at a guy with tremendous traits, like I want him on the team. You know, I want him on the team with a guy that's older. And I understand, like you paid him a lot of money. It's going to be a big cap hit. But if if you have a succession plan and you go from a top ten quarterback right to a top ten quarterback. Like you're a successful organization. And I understand there's a win now mentality with all these teams and you're going to have to extend some of these playmakers and things like that. But man, like I think there's something nice about just saying, Hey, this is the guy we believe in. This is the next thing. And I, and, and I would push back on me if I was, but I've seen it be successful. It's been successful in Green Bay. It's been successful in Baltimore. It's been successful in Kansas City. Like this model works. And now I agree. They paid a lot of money to Kirk. You want this to be successful. You want them to make a Super Bowl. But I also think, like, I look at quarterback development as its own thing also. And this is going to give Penix an opportunity to be the most successful version of himself. So, I I don't know. If if Kirk balls out to the point where they, in three years, are like, man, Penix hasn't played because Kirk's been playing so good, that's a good problem to have, I think. Sure. But my argument, my counter argument would be, if you haven't won a Super Bowl... And they got close, especially. What could you have done with that pick that could have helped you elevate? Yeah. Right. Like, but I think that's, that's the, that's the that's, counter. That's the other thing, though. And we're having this conversation a week after the draft that I find, I'll always find interesting is we're saying, oh, they could have drafted Roma Dunze, right? Or they could have drafted any player. But how many times have we seen those guys like just not work out for whatever reason, injury, sure. you know, lifestyle, whatever it is, right? And so I think like, that hypothetical is always really tough to do today. Now, if in... But like, I can play that game with Penix too. Like, what if Penix accuracy issues when he doesn't have Roma Dunze and Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk, all of a sudden, like, if he stinks, what if they go three or two really good years of Kirk, think that they are getting the next Patrick Mahomes, and he turns into someone who's terrible, and like, now you've not maximized Kirk, and your next guy stinks. Like, we don't don't know. We don't know. Evaluate process. But I'm, yeah, but I'm saying, but I, but I'm saying, like I think, I think we need to. This is something I think we need to transition because quarterback is so valuable. And you talked about different boards, and if you think he's the best player on the board, like you need to treat that like a valuable asset. And a first round pick for a guy you think could do it at the NFL level is not an over ask, in my opinion. Now, I do think to be fair to this whole argument and to the Atlanta Falcons and to like everyone who's pissed at them, I do think they were a little bit, they were kind of marching to the beat of their own drum in terms of valuation. So like you take Michael Penix. We've talked about that decision as not, not ad nauseum, but you also draft draft Rook Aroro before Johnny Newton, before Tavondre Sweat, before uh, Chris Jenkins, guys that had a little bit higher floors. They're obviously kind of doing their own evaluation thing, which is fine. But I also think that when you start bucking trends when it comes to kind of consensus draft boards around the NFL, things can get a little bit hairy. And I think that's kind of what they're doing here. And again, if it works out, great. You're the smartest guy in the room. But if it doesn't, you're also the Las Vegas Raiders or the Oakland Raiders when they were overdrafting guys left and right and kind of marching to their beat of their own evaluation. So I am with that 100%. But I do think I, I think the, the main point I want to get across here is financially, it's a weird thing. Michael Penix might never start. But I do think as teams, we need to understand the value of a quarterback. And also, I think if you get a guy that starts with that first pick, I, I think that's not even starts, just the value allocation needs to be, we need to be okay with that in the first round with quarterbacks specifically, I think, as a NFL community. Yeah, I would say the summarization of my point is, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to win a division? Are we trying to win a Super Bowl? And I would say I'm always trying to win the Super Bowl, whether it's now or later. Um, and are we acting with that long-term vision of, of what we are in place and also like how tight is the needle we're trying to thread here? And it seems like the Atlanta Falcons are trying to thread a very, very, uh, small eye of a needle, uh, to take, to take that to the literal, I don't know how much our listeners know about how much needles work. That's really the end of my needle knowledge too, Logan. It's like when you thread the needle and it is a, it's, 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 it's a tight window. It's a tight yeah, window for sure. Yeah, tight, tight window throw. Um, all right. Whose drafts do we really like? Um, there's, there's a couple of teams that seem to be getting rave reviews. One I want to talk about in the division is Philadelphia. Um, and I think, uh, Nick Wright made a really great point on, uh, his show on FS1 the other day, which is basically 
the Eagles get to win the draft every year because Howie Roseman's draft board seems to be the closest to the consensus media draft yeah. board. And so everyone just praises his picks. And then, you know, we look back a couple of years later and it's like, well, maybe we all missed on that guy, Howie included. Um, sometimes it's been great. Uh, like Jalen mm-hmm. Carter looks like that was a really good pick. And there's a reason that everybody had him really, really high. But they do get Kenyon Mitchell. Uh, they do get uh, Cooper DeJean. Uh, what do you make of the Eagles draft? Oh, yeah. So if you look at the Eagles draft, I mean, I love the picks. Like, I love Quinion Mitchell. Like, he was in contention of being the first defensive player selected. You get him at 22. I think that just shows you, you know, the value of being patient and playing the board as it comes to you. I know they wanted – I heard they wanted to trade up. But, you know, teams wanted offensive tackles. They wanted quarterbacks. So good defensive players get pushed down. Then you get Cooper DeGene, and I think he's an interesting evaluation because I think he's a safety kind of nickel, Buffalo nickel player, but a really good football player. They trade up for him with Washington, obviously. And I think Washington, I don't want to say they get the better of the trade, but you get, you know, a guy in uh, Sandra Still, who's a pretty good football player, kind of in the same mold. And then I, again, I like Jalex Jalex Hunt, the kid from Houston Christian, as an upside play. And I think it's a nice play by them because he's a guy that I think has tremendous athletic upside, converted safety, and doesn't have to be the guy right away. Will Shipley third down pass catching back. I think he's a great compliment to Saquon Barkley. Ran a 4-3-9 at his pro day. Nia Smith, kind of a gadget player. Jeremiah Trotter, we talked about him a little bit in the fifth round as a guy with tremendous football instincts. Trevor Keegan, depth along the offensive line. I love the Johnny Wilson pick in the sixth round. Just taking an absolute flyer on a guy with a lot of traits. So I think when you look at their board, and then they end up with a center in the in the as their last pick in the sixth round. I think when you look Who, at by the board, way, some people are calling baby Jason Kelsey. So yeah, um, he's an undersized guy, fit. really athletic. I I don't hate that comp- that comparison, but I think when you look at that, you say they took solid football players that filled need for them needs for them high in the draft, and then they took some flyers, kind of just swinging for the fences with guys like Johnny Wilson, a guy that I really enjoyed watching but is a little bit of a projection. And if he does hit, you get a nice number two receiver in a really stacked receiver room. So um, I I enjoy the draft. I think that value out of Johnny Wilson later might be my own personal bias in terms of valuation coming through. But if you look at their top four picks, I think you feel pretty good about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, two other teams that I'll highlight real quick that I've kind of got as, as winners, if you will. Um, everyone's got Pittsburgh. We don't need to talk too much about it, but you get Faltanu, Frazier, um, after they take Broderick Jones last year. So they've completely remade their offensive line in two years. Just a phenomenal job um, in Pittsburgh, kind of getting back to the core of who they are. Uh, Roman Wilson, like classic Steelers type of pick, tough as nails, great speed. Um, we'll do the dirty work and block. Like he's a great compliment uh, to uh, Pickett uh, or Pickens uh, that they've got there already. You know, Peyton Wilson, it's something that we were looking maybe even late first, early second uh, potential uh, linebacker, uh, but ultimately winds up falling down into the third. They get him there, uh, and then they round it out with some other guys. Uh, Mason McCormick, who a lot of people like, the guard Mm. from South Dakota State. Um, Logan Lee and then Ryan Watts, um, some big school guys in the sixth round. But the other team that I want to highlight um, is Arizona. and. The reason I highlight them is because I believe the number is 12. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 draft picks, Logan. And what Monty Austin for their GM did was latch on to what we know to be true. A shotgun approach is the best Mm. way to hit something in the draft. If they have a 50% hit rate, that is six players coming out of this draft. That's really good. Now, uh, I saw a GM in the athletic piece that I referenced earlier say, like, you know, for some of these guys, the collection of players, he's like, I'd rather just have Will Anderson, who was awesome for Houston last year and part of the reason they have so many picks. But they got Marvin Harrison, Darius Robinson, Mac Mel- Max Melton, three players that I know we were both all r- r- yeah. really, really high on. Trey Benson, some people think is the best running back in the draft. Um, and then, you know, a guy like Tip Ryman, a uh, nasty tight end. I feel like that's a Logan Paulson player. Yeah. Uh, old, tip, old Tip Ryman. Uh, in the third round, but they had, you know, we talked about Washington having so many picks in the top 100, Arizona was right there with them and they took some big swings and you can do that when you have 12 picks. Like that's, that's the beauty of it. And I think the other thing about the 12 picks, is I think they're pretty well thought out. Like Isaiah Adams from Illinois, mauling tackle guard prospect. You mentioned tipped Ryman, Elijah Jones. A lot of people think he can start in the NFL. Uh, Taylor Demerson, Demerson from Texas Tech and absolutely scoot, you know, with the fastest safety at the combine, good ball production. Xavier Thomas, Tracy Edge Rusher, Christian Jones, swing tackle could potentially be a starter for you. Like, 
you know, I think a lot of people look at this and say, oh, um, I'd rather have um, Will Anderson, but I, I disagree with that. I think when you look at the players they're able to accrue through this draft process, a lot of these guys are going to be significant contributors for you and just raise the tide of that team in a really nice way and add some really solid depth. So, and again, I, can, I don't think I can overstate the value of Marvin Harrison in this draft for them. Like just as a blue chip wide receiver and you couple that with um, Darius Robinson, a guy who I think is going to be, I don't know about a star, but just a very solid professional athlete that's going to, you know, I think make a name for himself in Arizona. So, you know, that, that comes because of that trade. And as much as Will Anderson's a good football player, like I think you've given yourself a lot of bites of the apple. Some of these guys are going to hit even the value of Trey Benson. Like think about Trey Benson as a back in that offense. 6'2", 230, 225 pounds, runs a 4'3". Runs like he's an explosive playmaker in, a, in an offense that wants to run the ball. So I just say like it's it's all there for you. And if what if what if two of those guys hit? Do you still feel the same way about Will Anderson? I don't, you know, like, and I think right. that's the thing. Like, I'm always a big advocate. One player is never worth three. It's just not. Like, I don't care how good the player ends up right. being. Unless like, it's a quarterback. Unless it, unless yeah. it's like elite quarterback, it's just very hard to make that, uh, that argument. Unless it's Michael Penix. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that that's my approach, right? If you can trade back, and again, it's hard to trade back. Like, and I know people like really trust their evaluations, but, Sometimes the difference between player A and player B is not that much and you can get more picks. Like I think I think more teams should be engaging in that. It just it's it's challenging sometimes to to get trading partners. But I I love Arizona's draft from that perspective, no doubt. That that is one of the things that, you know, people ask me, Oh, what do you think of Adam Peters trading back in the division with uh with Philly? And I'm like, I think Washington probably wins that trade because they got more picks. Yeah. Like San Rasil plus uh Senate, is that gonna yeah. be better than Cooper DeGene? Probably like what are yeah. the chances that Cooper DeGene swings the NFC East? Uh, not that high with, and I like Cooper DeGene. Um, other random uh, team. I was just poking through the team. See if there's anybody else we want to talk about uh, the Tennessee Titans, a team that took a lot of flack because I think they overdrafted players based off the consensus board. And again, we're talking yeah. about value and we kind of talked about them already. How about this though? Five of their seven draft picks. Uh, their first name starts with the letter J. Really? Yeah, J.C. Latham. Then they took Devondre Sweat and Cedric Gray. Then you got Jarvis Brownlee Jr., uh, Jaquan Jackson, Double J, James Williams, and Jalen Harrell. This is the type of hard hitting analysis people come here for, you know, just the yeah. J draft. The J yeah, I, have fun with I, that again. I, I, I go back to you know, like I, I like their. I can't draft. believe you're like about JC to have Latham. some kind of reaction and analysis to my incredibly stupid draft fact. No, I just think about their draft. Like everyone was like mad about the J.C. Latham thing. I think he could end up being a maybe the best offensive tackle, right tackle in this draft class. Because from a physical standpoint, the one the one thing about their draft that I find a little bit confounding is as much as I like Tavondre Sweat to pick him in the second round, even though you don't have a third round pick, feels like a little like a touch of desperation. Logan, you know, like it's it's not only a touch of desperation. They could have taken Jerzon Newton. They could have had another J. It's wild, man. Like, what do you? It's right there for you, Callahan's. And especially, maybe you're trying to get like a you know a certain type of player. You know, obviously, there's not too many 366 pound guys walking around that can rush the pass like he can. The problem but, is sometimes he's 380. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's the issue for me. So you know, they did what they did, and I like I like the players. It's just about you know, yeah, long term. What what are we getting there? So for sure. All right, uh, that is our show for today. Uh, Trevor Sikama, whose name does not start with a J, uh, is likely going to join us early next week. So be on the lookout for that. Depending on when we record that, that might wind up being the late week pod uh, next week, though. So uh, we'll get back with Trevor, and uh, I'll try to announce that on the radio show. Uh, for more draft analysis, definitely check us out on the Hoffman Show, 4 to 7 on the Team 980, and all the stuff that we did earlier this week had a bunch of great reaction with a bunch of great reporters, including uh, some reporters who covered uh, Jaden Daniels and Brandon Coleman, for instance, in college. So uh, check out that on my YouTube page at Craig Hoffman or in the Hoffman Show podcast feed. Uh, for Logan, I'm Craig. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>